It's really good to be here. It's always a pleasure to be in Australia. This is my fifth trip. This is my uh, first trip to the, uh, to the Brisbane area, but it's always great to be here. Great to see people that I know and also, of course, lots of you who I haven't met yet. I have uh, 44 minutes and 59 seconds. Maybe we haven't started. Perhaps I'll just keep talking. Um, and this is something I feel really passionate about. This is something I've been working on for about five years um, now, both on a national and a global basis, and something that I think is, is really important for all of us within the ag industry, whether we're based here or in Europe or in the States. So with that, I'd like to begin by telling you that on a global basis, any beef production system can be sustainable. Doesn't matter to me whether you have Angus heifers waiting to be AI'd in a cow-calf operation in South Central Montana in the States, whether it's grass-fed Bos Indicus cattle in Argentina, or whether it's Chalet crosses in a small feed yard, again, in Eastern Montana in the States. Any beef production system can be sustainable, providing three things are in place. The most important one, the one that you all know is always the most important, is economic viability. If you don't make a profit this year, next year, five years' time, ten years' time, you're not going to be in business. And you're not going to pass that business on to your children and grandchildren. So the economics has always been the most important. It always will be the most important. But second to that is environmental responsibility. And we've all understood that in the cattle industry for years. This isn't a surprise to any of us. Or if it is, it shouldn't be. Because we look after the air and the land and the water every single day. But to the media, to the consumer, to the retailers, to the policy makers, they don't always see it that way. There's a perception that big, bad, modern agriculture is killing the planet. There's methane, there's nitrogen, there's leaching into rivers, you know, it's thought of as a bad thing. Which comes into the third pillar, social acceptability. And five to ten years ago, our audience wasn't as big. We got asked questions by our friends or our family, but now our audience is so much bigger, because consumers on a global basis are asking questions. And with the advent of Facebook and Twitter and LinkedIn and Wikipedia and Google, there are lots and lots of people willing to answer their questions for us. And they're not necessarily with the answers that do us as an industry a favor. So any system can be and should be sustainable. But again, to the media, to the consumer, this word is, is often thought as a buzzword that only applies to certain industries. It's only grass-fed beef, or only local beef, or only organic beef. And that there really is a place for all those systems. But conventional beef, whichever country we're talking about, also is a sustainable system, because otherwise it wouldn't be in place. The question is, how do we keep it being so for the next 10 years, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years? Bearing in mind that there is no one-size-fits-all, there is no, this is the only system, and the consumer has the right to choose. If anybody wants to buy this type of beef, this is a picture I took in a uh, Manhattan, New York about three years ago now. If anybody wants to pay $29 per pound for grass-fed beef, that's absolutely their choice. I personally am going to buy corn-fed beef, which I believe tastes really good, tends to be cheaper, and spend the other money on really expensive boots, than I am grass-fed beef. But I will defend anybody's choice to buy whatever they like, because we should all have that opportunity. But we do face a challenge, and as our colleague from Alanco talked about earlier, we're going to have more and more people on the planet in 40 years. In November, November 2011, on a global basis, we passed the 7.5 billion mark. By 2050, we're going to have about 9.5 billion people, so 20 to 30 percent more people on the planet. But as, again, was said earlier, we're going to need 60 percent more food to feed all of those people. So if we look at meat here, we've got beef in the dark green, pork in the middle green, poultry in the lighter green. We need more and more and more milk, meat and eggs to feed all those people. But if you look at the purple line coming down, that's arable land per person over that time. We're going to have more people, we're going to have less land for growing animal feed and growing human food. So we have to improve productivity, we have to improve efficiency to move forwards. But again, to the consumer, efficiency is good in terms of cars or trucks or iPads or phones. Efficiency in technology in terms of food is 
kind of frightening. People don't like those images. They have an image of food back in the 40s and 50s as being purer and better and more wholesome. So we have to be able to overcome that somehow. And as Temple said, we've got the anti-animal ag groups, and they are really smart. They know that a picture of Pamela Anderson in a bikini gets a lot more attention than me saying, buy some beef, it's great, you know? They even have demonstrations like this one at the top right. Those two girls were in Times Square. This was about uh, three years ago now. And that was the most child-friendly picture I could put up because behind that banner, those two girls have no clothes on whatsoever. So two naked girls, middle of the day, busy place, you know, gets a certain amount of attention from people. But the banner also gets attention. One pound of meat equals 2,463 gallons of water. That's a precise number. That sounds calculated. The problem is that number is six times too high. The correct number is 441 gallons. But because it sounds so scientific and it's quoted all over the internet, as we all know, once it's on the internet, it must be fact. So it becomes true. Which brings me to Meatless Mondays. And I know you have this over here, um, and we have it in the States as well. Los Angeles City Council in California, in their wisdom, recently adopted Meatless Mondays as the ideal way to cut the city's carbon footprint. So you can drive your huge truck to work every single day, but if you don't eat the cheeseburger, you're saving the planet for your kids and for your grandkids. And it's an easy thing for many consumers to do. For me personally, it would be really difficult, but for many people, they can easily swap the hamburger for the cheese sandwich or the tofu and feel like they're making a difference. But again, if we look at it on a scientific basis, Meat production in the States only accounts for 2.1% of our total carbon footprint. So the, only, the other 97.9% .9 comes from everything else. Cars, trucks, hospitals, factories, industry, and so on, so on. But again, any newspaper, any Facebook site, Twitter, food network, TV channels on a Monday will have handy recipes for going meatless and saving the planet. Well, at the moment, there are 314 million people, 314 million people in the United States, everybody from a tiny baby to an elderly person. The supposition is that if everybody went meatless every Monday for a whole year, would solve the problem. Except we wouldn't. Going meatless would cut our national carbon footprint by less than one third of 1%. Make almost no difference whatsoever. I did my very best to find similar figures for over here. And the problem that I found was I couldn't break out the contribution of greenhouse gases from dairy versus beef, sheep, lamb, and pork. But if we assume all meat in Australia, a one-seventh cut would cut your national carbon footprint by 1.5%. But you export 65% of your beef, 38% of your dairy, and 49% of your lamb. So even if everybody in, in the domestic market went meatless over here, it would still only cut your national carbon footprint by about 0.7%. Now, I'm not here to say that we shouldn't do everything we can to cut carbon, but to imply that we can do by not eating meat one day per week, frankly, doesn't make any sense at all. And it leads to other questions as well, because every picture here of a food, whether it's Vegemite, whether it's apples, whether it's oranges has an environmental impact. Absolutely everything we eat has some effect on carbon, land, water, fossil fuels, and so on. And the consumer often doesn't understand that. So if we go meatless, we've got to think about the other questions. As I said, I will defend the right of anybody to buy what they like. They want the beef sandwich, or the fish sandwich, or the vegetarian, or the vegan. That is their choice. That may be because back in high school in 1990, something back in England. I was a vegan for 12 months. And to be quite honest, I think I did it to really irritate my parents. Because catering suddenly became really difficult at Christmas, you know, when we're making like a bean loaf thing. And by that time I was 16, I was back eating bacon as if pigs were going out of fashion. And obviously now I'm eating a lot of beef because beef is, you know, good for babies. But I will defend anybody's right to choose what they like. But what really irritates me is being I should adopt a vegetarian or vegan or fruitarian or whatever diet because that's somebody else's ethos. We should all have that choice. 
Secondly, again, to the consumer, they don't always understand that we don't just get meat from animals. Every picture on this slide, whether it's camera film, whether it's dynamite, whether it's fertilizer, whether it's gummy bears, has an input from the cattle industry. What would be the carbon cost, the water cost, the energy cost, the fuel cost of sourcing all of these ingredients if we, had, if we didn't have a cattle industry, nationally or globally? And again, in the States, certainly we use a huge amount of byproduct feeds every single day. Everything from citrus pulp to sugar beet to apple, pomace to pea silage. What would we do with all of those things that either can't be or just aren't eaten by humans if we didn't have a cattle industry? So these are all questions that we've got to answer if we're going to eat less meat on a global basis. And then finally, on, on this topic, I know that we're going to be in here until about four o'clock today, five o'clock today. Imagine it's winter, so we're going to shut all the doors. And it's Monday, not whatever we are, Wednesday. So we've had a bean surprise for breakfast, because we're going to go meatless and save the world. And we had a bean burrito for lunch with added lentils. And a tofu surprise power bar halfway through the afternoon. And we've still got 400 people here with the door shut in an enclosed space and we've all been eating beans. It's not going to be a good place to be, is it? Because we make methane as well. It's not just about the cattle. So while it's tempting to say if you just cut out the hamburger and go to the broccoli bake, you know, you can save the world, we've got to think about it on a big picture basis. So let's do that with respect to the cattle industry. This is data from the States. We're going on hot carcass weight from 1977 on the left. 2007 is this blue bar coming down, and 2027 is out on the right-hand side. And our cattle have got bigger over time. So back in 1977, the average hot carcass weight was 274 kilos. 2007, 351. Question is, how much bigger can we get? Can we be slaughtering cattle in 20 years' time that weigh 1,000 kilos, 2,000 kilos, 3,000 kilos? To my three brothers, the idea of a T-bone that weighs 80 kilos is just a heaven on a plate, you know? But to the retailer, to the pet and to most consumers, that doesn't make sense. So certainly in the States, in terms of hot carcass weight, we can't do a lot more than we have at the moment. But where we have an opportunity in the States and in any industry, regardless of the location in terms of beef, is to improve productivity, to improve growth rate. Because if we can get our cattle to market in a faster time, if they're at optimum health, if, if, we, if we have optimum efficiency all the way down the chain, from the cow calf all the way to the packer, we're going to use less carbon, less water, less land, and less fuel. So again, we're comparing 1977 to 2007. And this is the consequence of that increase in carcass weight, 274 kilos to 351. 1977, it took five animals to make the same amount of beef as it took four animals in 2007. That means five lots of feed, five lots of waste, versus four lots of feed, four lots of waste. But what had a bigger impact was improvements in health, management, welfare, nutrition, genetics over time, which allowed us to increase growth rate. Because back in 1977, it took an average of 609 days to get an animal from birth to slaughter. 2007, we're down to 485 days. We've saved 124 days of feed, land, water, and so on. So if we multiply it out, five animals times 609 days compared to four animals times 485 days, you can see that in 1977, it took just over 3,000 animal days to make the same amount of beef as it took just over 1,900 animal days in 2007. So again, we saved 1,100 days of resources, of labor, of economics to make the same amount of beef. And that's a really important point. There's often a perception that if we're going to cut environmental impact, water, carbon, land, fuel, that that comes at a cost. And if we do it through improved productivity, we improve resource use, but we also improve the economic bottom line as well. So we have this double whammy. But as I say, we've got to look at it on a big picture basis. We can't just look at animals in the feedlot. So the data I'm going to show you, we published in the Journal of Animal Science two years ago now, again comparing 1977 to 2007, but we're going from the manufacture of the cropping in plants, so the pesticides, herbicides, and fertilizers to grow the crops all the way through, including transport, to the arrival of animals at the slaughterhouse door. The purple line at 100% is 1977, the green bars going up are 2007. So as I showed you, we've got an increase in 
carcass weight, 31% more beef per animal over that 30 year period. Excuse me. And what that means is per pound of beef, we need 70% of the animals, that's the total herd, cows, calves, heifers, bulls, steers, that we did in 1977 to make a pound of beef. Because we have fewer animals and they grow faster, we need 19% less feed, 12% less water, and water is going to be the really huge environmental a criteria for everybody in the world over the next year, two years, five years, ten years. And only 67% of the land. We've cut land use by a third over the last 30 years. Not because of a drive to cut any of these things, but simply doing what the beef industry all over the world does best, making safe, affordable beef in the most efficient way possible to use fewer resources and therefore to lower economic cost. Again, because we need fewer animals, because they grow faster, we have less waste per pound of beef, 18% less waste, 18% less methane, 12% uh, less nitrous oxide, and we've got a 16% decrease in the carbon footprint per pound of beef between 1977 and 2007. And we will see similar patterns and similar trends in most developed beef industries on a global basis. And I believe there was a similar project to this being done in Australia at the moment, and there was certainly one done in Canada about two years ago now. So we have a great message to tell the consumer, but it's not always getting out there. Now, as I said, there is a place for every system. Please don't go away thinking, I think grass-fed is bad, or organic is bad, or local is bad. There really is a place for everybody. But I hate mismarketing. It drives me absolutely crazy. My system's better than your system, because I don't use product X. And product X may do weird things to you or your kids that make you frightened, so you shouldn't buy this beef. We even have quotes like this one at the bottom from Michael Pollan. Michael Pollan is a journalism professor at UC Berkeley in the States. Gained a lot of fame and fortune, does a heck of a lot of talks every single year, telling people what they should and shouldn't eat. He read the book, um, he wrote the book, The Omnivore's Dilemma, back in 2006. If you haven't read that book, you really need to read that book. Not because it will make you happy and joyful and good about being an ad. If you're anything uh, like me, and I read that book probably five or six years ago now, I got through a really big bottle of Jack Daniels just to get through that book. Because quite frankly, it made me really, really angry. Because there's some truth in it and a lot of skewed stuff which is complete nonsense. But it's easy to read, easy to understand to the consumer, they say, okay, now I understand the ag industry, and maybe it's not as good as I thought it was. So we have all these advertisements out there. So, look, so let's look at the environmental impact of grass-fed beef. Again, this is in the States. Three bars here, conventional, natural, grass-fed. Conventional is in black, natural is in green, grass-fed is in light, yellowish green. Again, we published this in the Journal of Animal, in the journal Animal about two years ago now. In the conventional system in the States, it takes us about 444 days on average to raise an animal with a hot carcass weight of 364 kilos. In this example, that's using ionophores, implants, beta agonists, and, M and MGA for heifers well approved by the FDA for those animals. So what that means is ionophores and implants in the background are in the feedlot, MGA in the feedlot, beta agonists in the feedlot. If we go to natural beef, which in this example is exactly the same as conventional beef, but we've taken out the implants, ionophores, MGA, and beta agonists, we lose carcass weight. So the days don't really change. We've gone from 444 days to 464 days. But we've lost 24 kilos of carcass weight. So therefore, to make the same 11.8 billion kilos of beef that we do in the States every single year, we suddenly need over 14 million more total animals, cows, calves, heifers, bulls, steers. If we go still more extensive to grass-fed, again, we can still make that 11.8 billion kilos of beef every single year. But our calf to sweat has now come down to 279 kilos. And our days has gone up by 235. We've gone from 444 to 679. So we have lighter animals taking longer to finish. Again, to make the 11.8 billion kilos of beef, we can do it, but we suddenly need nearly 65 million more animals in the total US beef herd to maintain beef supply. 
But if we read Time magazine and Washington Post and Facebook and Twitter and so on and so on, it's grass-fed is the answer. It's healthier for us, healthier for the planet, healthier for everybody. Well, let's think about the environmental aspects. As I say, we could change over overnight. We could get rid of the US feedlot industry. But we'd need an increase in land use equivalent to 52 million hectares, which in context, for those from the states, is 75% of the land area of Texas, or those of you, most of you from here, that's over twice the area of Victoria. In terms of the carbon footprint, that's going to increase by 134 million metric tons. Again, in context, that's like adding 27 million cars to load every single year, simply by a changing on a whole industry basis from corn-fed beef to grass-fed beef. And in terms of water use, which I really do think is going to be the really crucial issue, because none of us or the consumer can see or taste or feel carbon, really. It's this kind of nebulous gas that's out there and does weird things, and perhaps it's a hoax from the government, we're not entirely sure. But people understand water. We need water, our pets need it, our animals need it, our plants need it. So water is going to be the really big thing. And again, if we got rid of the US feedlot industry, changed over to entirely glass-fed beef, we could do it, but we'd increase water use by over 17 trillion liters. That's the equivalent of 53 million households. As I said earlier, we have 314 million people in the States at the moment. So assuming two people per household, we've got about 150 million households. It's like adding a third more people just to make the same amount of beef in terms of water use. So it really is considerable. So let's move from grass-fed versus corn-fed to technology in beef. And we often have advertisements like this, and you probably can't see the text on the side of this um, attractive looking Hereford steer, or rather bull, but it says ingredients, estradiol, estradiol benzoate, testosterone propionate, progesterone, seminal, TBA, MGA, which I always think is interesting because pretty sure that isn't a heifer, and then B. So again, to the consumer, the perception is if you buy conventional beef, you're buying this hormone-laden, chemical-laden, you know, soup of things that are going to do bad stuff to you. But if you buy other kinds of beef, or dare I say it, pork or chicken or turkey or tofu, your life will be so much better. So I'd like to digress from efficiency just for one minute to talk about hormones in beef, because this is a conversation I keep having, and therefore I'm fairly sure that you guys may do as well. And I don't want to be gender biased here, but it's normally a conversation I have with women between the ages of 20 and let's say 50. And they have kids and they're concerned about themselves, their family and their kids, which is great because we all should be. And the conversation goes something like, you know, we've given up eating beef and dairy. And I get a little offended, obviously. And I say, well, why? Well, you know, our kids are so much bigger nowadays. They're growing breasts at the age of three. They're seven foot two by the age of seven. And it's because of the hormones used in the beef industry and the dairy industry. And I say, interesting, okay. So let's look at estrogen in implanted beef. And it is absolutely true there is more estrogen in a steak from an implanted animal than a non-implanted animal, about 40% more. So in a 200 gram steak from a non-implanted animal, we've got 3.5 nanograms of estrogen. From the implanted animal, we're up to 5.1. So there is more estrogen. Bear in mind, one nanogram as a concentration is a bit like one blade of grass on a football field. Tiny, tiny, tiny quantity. But then let's look at these. Birth control pills, taken by 100 million women on a global basis every single day for years and years and years. Every one of those teeny tiny little pills contains 35,000 nanograms of estrogen. That means the average woman would have to eat over 3,000 pounds or about uh, 1,200 kilos of beef every single day from an implanted animal to get the same amount of estrogen as from one tiny little pill. I presented, I, I presented this data at the Wisconsin Cattlemen's Association back in January. And there was a guy right down at the front, he looked honestly about 137 years old. And he's like talking and dozing and then talking and dozing again and whatever. And, um, but he gave me the best line that I've ever heard about this data. Because he sits there and he's 
kind of a little bit shaky and he says, ma'am, I don't want to mess with the woman who can eat 3,000 pounds of beef per day. <laughs> you are so right. You know, don't anyway mess, but even if you have to mess with us, don't do it when we think that's that much beef. So, let's look at the environmental and the economic effects of using technology in the beef system. And, and this is on the whole system, but bearing in mind that in this example, implants are used in the background and the feedlot and beta agonists in the feedlot. So all we're doing as we go across this graph, we're adding in a beta agonist, adding in implants, or adding in both. As we add in more product productivity enhancing technologies, we get better carcass weights and it takes us fewer days. So adding in a beta agonist, we get an increase in hot carcass weight of 15 kilos. And in implants, we now get an increase in hot carcass weight of uh, 35 kilos and it's taken us 26 fewer days. And in both, we've gone up to 378 kilos, so an increase of 50 kilos and again, 26 fewer days. What that means is we can either make the same amount of beef using fewer total animals or we can make more beef with the same animals, which is even better, obviously. But, as I say, there's a direct correlation between the economics and environmental impact because they also reduce the feed costs. So we become more efficient, we allow our animals to perform better, therefore it's proportionally less feed, less land, less water and less cost per pound of beef. That's going to be increasingly important as we have all those more and more and more people to feed and they all want to eat more beef. So let's look at it on a carcass weight basis. 363 kilos is the average carcass weight in the States at the moment. If we use both implants in the background on the feedlot and a beta agonist in the feedlot, we cut the total carbon footprint by 10.7%. And that doesn't sound that impressive, you know? 10.7, it's not 50 or 70. But bear in mind that regardless of the location, between 65 and 80% of, of a pound of beef or kilo of beef's carbon footprint comes from the cow-calf operation. Now, do not go home and say, cow-calf guys are bad and the feedlots are good, because that's not my message, okay? But, in the cow-calf operation, we have a cow and a calf and part of a bull and part of a heifer. In contrast, in the background and the feedlot, we only have growing animals. So we have far more animals to maintain on an input-to-output basis in the cow-calf operation than we do in the other sectors. So the fact that just using technologies in the background and the feedlot can cut the carbon footprint by nearly 11% overall, when that 11% is coming from a total between 20 and 35%, is really quite impressive. And again, per carcass, we're saving nearly four metric tons of feed, 0.4 of a hectare of land, and 86,000 litres of water. Again, a growing concern. We've got more and more and more people and water is really, really becoming crucial. But how do we sell this to the consumer? Because I have to admit, I can't picture 86,000 litres of water. I just can't see that quantity and nor can anybody else very often. So we've got to sell it on a social basis. We've got to talk about feeding more people, making our kids healthier and happier. So being a huge data nerd, I was home about 18 months ago now, and someone asked me to calculate how many kids we could feed with the extra beef on one steer given implants and a beta agonist. And the answer was that we could feed seven school children, not the total beef, the extra beef on one carcass, with the beef containing school meals for one entire year. I thought, wow, that's pretty powerful. Because on a global basis, one in eight kids at the moment doesn't have enough food. And for many of them, their only source of protein every single day is at school. So if we can feed more kids, that's got to be a positive, right? But still, again, to the consumer, antibiotic, hormone, implant, beta agonist are frightening words. But let's think about the size of the companion animal industry. People pay millions for their cats and their dogs and their horses and their bunny rabbits every single day. They understand the, Im the importance of parasite control for their pets. So therefore, parasite control for our cattle should be an easy sell, right? It's only right that our cattle should be healthy, should perform well. If we use effective 
parasite control, this time going all the way through the chain, cow, calf, backgrounder, and feedlot. The extra beef in the average US cow calf herd, and the average herd as a mean number is only 35 cows. But the extra beef from that average 35 cow herd for improved reproduction and improved growth of the calves will feed 19 families with their entire beef demand for a whole year. Again, just doing what is right to keep our cattle healthy in this case makes more beef, gives us healthier animals, and therefore gives us healthier people. But the social component is really difficult to deal with. And I appreciate that over, that over here, you don't have beta agonists. But in the States, Zilmax was taken out of our, our uh, industry on August 6th because Tyson said that they weren't going to accept um, beef from cattle given Zilmax, a beta agonist. So I'm sorry, it's September 6th not August 6th. So we're now 47 days past that. And, and the economic loss to the industry, simply based on all the beef that we've lost because we don't have that tool, as of today, is equal to $76.6 .6 million. So it does have a huge impact. But in contrast to many of the conversations that I've had with people, it's not just an impact at the feedlot level. Because if you guys have less income, then proportionally everybody else does too. Because there's less income for the DVM, the nutritionist, the accountants, the factory workers, everybody has less. So any technology that's taken out or any tool that's taken out that means that as an industry we have less income is going to filter back down the chain. So at the moment, the loss of Zilmax as of September 6th in the States per head at the moment is costing feeders $23.07. If we also lost Octoflex, it would be $33.56 per head. And those costs filter down, as I say, to the backgrounder and to the cow car. So we face some significant threats if we lose access to the tools, the technologies, and the management practices that make us a highly efficient industry. Which leads me to pink slime. Pink slime was a big issue about 18 months ago now. Pink slime, otherwise known as lean, finely textured beef. It had been used in the beef industry in the States for over 30 years. It was safe, it was approved, there was no issues with it. Until a TV chef, Jamie Oliver, called it pink slime and all hell broke loose. You know, what's this stuff you're adding into my beef? It looks gross, I don't want it. It came out of the retail chain really, really, really quickly. But, but what that efficiency loss meant was that the retail price of beef went up by 1.6%. Now, I love beef, and that change to me didn't make that much difference. But if I had four kids and then 20 grand per year, that would put beef out of my pocket, and I'd have to instead eat pork or chicken or even tofu. So anything that makes us lose efficiencies is going to have that economic cost. And from a cattle point of view, simply by losing pink slime or lean, finely textured beef, we need 1.7 million more head in, in our national cattle population to still make that 11 billion kilos of beef every single year. So it does have an impact. So the question becomes, what can we do all through the sector? And as you all know, our cattle's optimum performance to their genetic potential can only be achieved by good genetics and good management all the way through. Good handling, good feeding, nutrition, welfare, all of these aspects are going to have a huge impact. So we've got to look at them all the way through the chain. So two examples from the cow-calf industry. As I say, there's a, there's a huge tie between economics and environmental impact. Here, we're looking at calving rates. In the States, at the moment, only 90% of cows have a calf every single year. What that does economically is add 5.5% to the cost per pound of beef. If we go more extensive here, to an area where only 60% of cows have a calf every year. Characteristic of Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, and Northern Australia in some areas. That adds 58% to the feed cost per pound of beef because we have that loss in efficiency. So if we go back to the States, 
nine, only nine out of 10 cows have a calf every single year. That means per pound or per kilo of beef, we need 6.7% more cattle, we need 8% more land, and we need just over 5% more water per pound of beef. To, to anybody here who is in the cow-calf in, cow -calf industry, excuse me, I believe having all of your cows have a calf every year is the biggest single thing you can do to improve the entire cattle industry. Because if we have that loss at the beginning point in the chain, those things can't be made up later on down the chain. We don't have those opportunities to make that up. Another example is death loss. And in this example, again, we're talking about cow-calf, but this applies all the way down the chain for every animal that we raise to be you know, 200 kilos, 400, 600 even, and then we lose it. That's a huge amount of feed and labor and time and economics gone into an animal that in the end doesn't give us anything at all. So again, in a thousand cow herd, for example, if, if we cut average calf mortality from 5% to 2, we can have huge savings in terms of feed, in terms of carbon, in terms of water. And as Dr. Grandin said earlier, the preconditioning can have a huge impact on the mortality and the morbidity of the cattle coming into the feedlot. If it's at optimum efficiency all the way through, we're going to see those gains. And finally, for this example, cow body weight. If you ask almost anybody in the States who has cows, they'll say their average cow size is about 1,200 pounds. So what's that in kilos? About, bleh, Rain's gone to sleep, 500 or so kilos. And all I can say is there are a lot of very, very, very big 1,200 pound cows out there, because they're like this big and they do not weigh 1,200 pounds. So in this example, we're going from a cow mature weight of 703 over here to 476 over here. If we can maintain output, if we can still have calves that perform well and grow to a good weight, but we can simply maintain less cow to get that calf output, again, we need less land, less water, less feed, it costs us less, and we have a lower carbon footprint. So really it's about doing anything we can all the way through the chain, calf, cow calf, backgrounder, feedlot, and then the packer to improve efficiencies, to make sure that we don't have losses. So it begins with the cow. If every cow has a calf every single year, we're doing well. If those calves grow well, if fewer of them die or are sick, if they enter the backgrounder or the feedlot at a sensible weight, if the cows themselves last for five years, six years, eight years, not two or three or four, if the cattle have the optimum lean yield for the market, which is obviously dependent on your area, but also the correct amount of marbling, then we're going to have positive effects all the way through, both on economics and on environmental impact. And key to all of this is going to be health, because if we don't have healthy cattle all the way through, then we're going to have losses, and they're going to be unavoidable. Because as I said at the beginning, there is no one size fits all. There is no optimum. I'm not here to say you should all do everything in exactly the same way as we do in the States. That absolutely won't happen. But if in every system, whether it's Australia, whether it's the States, whether it's Argentina, whether it's Ireland, if we suit the system to the resources, to the land that we've got, the capacity that we've got, the water we've got, the labor we've got, the market we've got, if we do all of that in the most efficient way possible, we have a really good chance of feeding all of those, those kids in 40 years' time with safe, affordable, nutritious beef every single day. And as a final word, I should warn you, because um, I'm a scientific paper junkie. So I did casually wonder whether anybody's done the carbon footprint of kangaroos. And there is a paper out there on the carbon footprint of kangaroos. So the bad news, I have to tell you, that somebody has written a paper, and it's actually Wilson and Edwards, 2008. They've calculated that if you cut your national cattle and sheep population by 93%, 
You increase your kangaroo population from 34 million to 175 million. You can produce the same amount of meat and you can cut your carbon footprint by 3%. So you should all feel very happy and secure in your jobs for the future because I don't think this is going to happen. But be warned, it could be out there and kangaroo may be the future. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for listening to me and not laughing too much when I fell up the stairs rather than just walking up the stairs. Um, you have my email address here. I'm on Twitter, as we said, as Bovi Diva, um, which is a name that somebody else gave me. It appears to fit. I have a blog that I update roughly once a month when things kind of really irritate me, and so I write things about them at bovidiva.com. And there's a, a copy of this presentation as a PDF at the link at the bottom. So with that, thank you so much.